Okay, howdy. Uh, my name is Karok Ray. I am the director of the Mays Innovation Research Center here at Texas A&M. Uh, and I am also the host of our talk show uh, on YouTube called Innovation Matters, where we interview uh, alumni uh, from Texas A&M on uh, some of the latest uh, innovations and their entrepreneurship over their careers. Uh, just to remind you, the Mays Innovation Research Center is an academic research center here at Texas A&M. We, there's a lot of things we do. We host conferences, we fund research, and we spread our knowledge about innovation broadly, including uh, uh, activities and outlets like this. Today, we're delighted to have Robert Irving join us. Uh, uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his career in, uh, that spanned, really, uh, I guess, emergency response and, and the, fire, the fire protection yeah. and his path of entrepreneurship. So, uh, Robert, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I no, appreciate y'all inviting me. So, tell us, Robert, uh, tell us where'd you grow up? So I grew up in a, a little town in East Texas. It's called Hemphill. It's about an hour east of Lufkin, Nacogdoches uh -huh. area. So uh -huh. right on the border of Texas and Louisiana. That's where, that's where I grew up and had uh, two older sisters that went to A&M. Oh, uh, great. And so it's kind of a generational. My parents didn't go here, but generational uh -huh. in that sense. And so I kind of followed right along. Oh, great, great. Yeah. And then when you came to campus, what did you decide? What college were you <coughs> in? What did you major in? Yeah, so I came here. I actually came here on a scholarship uh, to, to power lift. So I was, I was an athlete. Uh, at a and M. Oh wow, you were a powerlifter. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, so I, I uh, yeah, so I, I powerlifted for four years for a and um, I did an undergrad, and, and I started out in engineering actually. And, and I have an uncle down in uh, in Houston that I went to yeah. spend a week with, and he convinced me to switch over to business. And uh -huh. uh, and he kind of it was one of those stereotypical things where you know lawyers and doctors and engineers they all have, make high salaries, and he's like, well, what nobody tells you is how much money you can make in business. Uh -huh. I was eighteen, and so he he owns a couple of companies down there, and so I went and spent a week with him and, and did all that, and uh, and then swapped my Swap my major to business. Oh wow! Well, well, that's impressive. Tell me, what was your max deadlift? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I won three national titles uh, wow. while I was at A&M. So I, I deadlifted uh, 675 pounds. Oh my gosh! At, at 181. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And then uh, how about squat? Can you tell us the squat? Uh, a little over 5, 25, 530. Wow! That's was, impressive. Yeah. Now, was there a team here on yeah. powerlifting team? Yeah, yeah. Your, yeah. So it was you were one, on that. Yeah, yeah. In high school, you know, they did equipped powerlifting, meaning you had to wear like suits and all that stuff. Right. Right. And um, I remember getting here. In my first year, I I, uh, you, I kept getting beat, and, it, and I uh -huh. figured out why. So I didn't have the money to yeah. buy all the expensive equipment, and so yeah. I mean, these things were thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah. And so I got frustrated with it, and I was like, you know, this was right when we're all powerlifting, meaning that you just don't wear anything; you just have on, you know, just a pair of shorts, if you will. Right, um, right. So that's I transitioned into that, and was fairly successful, and that's whenever I uh, I moved my way up, went to Florida. Went to um, Pennsylvania, Colorado, went all over. Oh, great, great, great. Good for you. So you transitioned into the Mays Business School, is that you said? Yeah, so I started out actually at Blend Team. Uh -huh. um, and so that was kind of where I was uh, at the very beginning and transitioned from Blend Team full-time into A&M. Uh -huh. um, and, and my degree is actually human resources and then uh, with a, a focus in business. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And I also saw during your time at A&M, you were at the rec center leading the strength and conditioning yeah. team. Is yeah. That right? so I worked there for four years, uh -huh. uh, four or five years. Right, As a right student? In, yep. yep okay. Right in the grad school, managing the weight room. Uh, went through the expansion. So when we, when we right. built the, the new one, that was uh, a long, arduous process. Um, but yeah, I worked there. That was, that was really the, you know, the, the thing that kick-started my career, if you will, was working uh, for Jared Wilson and those guys. And yeah. um, it's funny just how serious they took that job looking back on it. Uh -huh. You know, it's a weight room, right? It's not, <laughs> but, like, you yeah. go talk to Jared. He's probably Yeah, like, I know Jared, yeah. He's the most serious boss I've ever had. Oh, I bet. Oh, dude, the guy's <laughs> an, he's extremely <laughs> yeah. intense. Yeah, yeah, he is intense, and, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I worked right under his yeah. wing for four years. Oh, you know? wow. Yeah. Oh, that's Every great. day. So. Yeah, they've got a great, they've got a great yeah. line of, of trainers, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. used them once, actually, last year. Great. I had great results, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. So, so tell me, what did you do what, when you graduate when you're about to graduate uh, yeah. what were you thinking of, of doing at that point yeah so I was looking at 2014 so actually in 2012 so my father's a 30-year uh, firefighter uh-huh uh -huh, and so great. in 2012 um, they had this contract with a company called iris to go overseas uh, uh -huh. to Afghanistan yeah. to do contract firefighting uh -huh. so I was like you know they're paying those guys a lot of money and yeah. it was tax-free because you spent so many days out of country yeah yeah and uh, my dad was like you know you need to look into this so I went through Teeks fire school right so oh, I great. did EMT very famous fire school right right, right. oh yeah, yeah best yeah. in the world world, 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 world yeah, class absolutely yeah, yeah. so I went through EMT school uh, fire school hazmat aircraft rescue I was teed up and ready to go. So you did all that while you were a student or after? I was, so I took off the spring semester of 2012. Uh -huh, so from uh -huh. January to June, uh -huh. I spent five days a week, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours a day between EMT school, fire school, all that stuff was just back to back to back. Wow. And, and that uh, was to train yourself to become a, to become a firefighter. firefighter. Okay. Yep. So I got TCFP certified, got all that stuff done, and I was fixing, you know, was thinking about going. 
and they unoccupied the military bases uh, with military personnel. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, I'm not going to Afghanistan right. with a water hose. Right, right, um, right, right. A big water hose. And so um, <clears throat> re-enrolled back into college, um, you know, and, and finished up my degree on, you know, kind of an accelerated path because I'd missed a semester, if you yeah, will. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and yeah, so, you know, that, that experience with that information kind of led me to Mark Benden. Uh -huh, and so uh -huh, that's uh -huh. whenever I went and met with Mark. Um, it was probably in 2013, 2014, and started looking at the master's program. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, you know, showed him the skill set that I had from the fire school. And I was Great. like, hey, this, this really plays into the safety engineering realm yeah, right. of what you're doing. That's right. um, I think I could couple all this together and, and make a career out of this was kind of the, was my thought process going from undergrad. So for those of you who don't know, Mark is a, is a good friend. He's a, uh, really an icon here at, at Texas A&M. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He's a faculty affiliate of the Mays Innovation Research Center. He's very entrepreneurial. He's a, an engineer that's kind Absolutely. of based in, in public health. Uh, yeah. Did a lot of work on standing desks, started a company, uh, yeah. sold to Verydesk. Uh, very uh, entrepreneurial and, and exciting. You walk in his office and he's got 15 patents on the wall. Yeah, that's you know, right. He's, that's he's, right. He's a great guy. That's so, right. Yeah. I, I know his sons well and I've, I've worked with him for a while. And, so during undergrad is when I joined um, the Entrepreneurial Society here at A&M. Uh -huh, and so, uh -huh. um, what is it called? It's Aggie. So there's a few. There's a, there's a McFerrin Center. Yep. There was the, which back Startup then? Startup Aggieland. Startup Aggieland. Yep. Okay, yep. you joined so, Startup Aggieland. Yep, Startup so I, I joined Startup Aggieland and actually created a product there. Um, so that was, was my that? first, so it was called Smart Spray, and it was my first real entrepreneurial thing. Uh -huh. So whenever I was transitioning from undergrad to grad school, yeah. I took a job at uh, Mechanical Engineering, uh -huh. um, and I was running all their 3D printing labs. Uh -huh. So I was teaching SolidWorks, I was teaching the 3D printing, and it was really on the cusp of innovation. Right. And so going through all these machines, the different um, PLA plastics and all this stuff. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I, I created this product. My, one of my sisters, um, she wasn't like severely attacked, but she was attacked in New Orleans one time, and I had this idea. I was like, you know, what if you had this pepper spray product that grabbed your phone, right? So what it was was a retractable spring that would grab your phone, uh -huh. right? And, uh -huh. and it was a pepper spray. And so inside it, we used uh, the hardware, basically like what you use as a mouse, right? It's low power Bluetooth ping technology. Yeah. And it, it rerouted to an app. And uh -huh. so as soon as you deployed this pepper spray, uh -huh. it would um, call 911. It would send a text message to preset contacts of your geo location. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, it would take pictures and, you know, do all that stuff. And it would tell them like, hey, you know, the pepper spray's been deployed. This person's in, in distress. And I actually received um, a grant from Blake Petty on uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. That's and, great. Um, and yeah, so we were running with it, filing the patents and everything. And, oh, great. And you filed the patent on it? Yeah. Nice. So well, the, the story doesn't end great. Okay. Um, okay. So there was uh, three MIT engineers that had, uh, I think it was $990,000 more than I did. Uh -huh. uh, I think my grant was ten grand. Uh -huh. And uh, so they had about 990000 more. And they had a pretty much the same thing. I reached out to them and talked to them for a little bit because uh -huh. I felt like I had a better mousetrap. Right. Theirs right. was a standalone pin product, but it used the same technology. It contact, you know, that's kind of same a... Same idea. Right, exact same idea. Oh, but okay, it just okay. didn't, it didn't grab to everything. This thing was just a retractable spring. You grab your leg. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah. just, a, it would just grab anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we kind of, at that point, we kind of punted and, and pivoted and... And, um, you know, they, they had already filed a provisional patent before we did. Oh, I see. And I so see. it's kind okay. of one of those situations yeah, yeah, where right. you're, you know, kind of stuck between a rock and a hard spot. Right, 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 um, right. But that was like probably the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey and, and figuring out, you know, like one of the things that I figured out through that it was really cool was they, they kept tasking me with figuring out who your target market is, who you can sell this to. Right. It's kind of obvious. Right. Sell it to the women, right? right well, that right. wasn't the truth. Whenever I, when we did all this market research, it was actually the dads and the brothers the dads, huh? that were oh, buying it for the, yeah, uh, yeah. for the, their daughters and, and yeah, wives sisters, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Realtors were buying it for the real estate agents that go out alone. And, Interesting. And, um, yeah, it was, it was very interesting to see kind of like, you know, maybe it's not, not what you think it is. Right. That's so. great. That's great. Well, that was a great experience you had. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, uh, uh, you fabricated that through your kind of your 3D printing knowledge. Is yeah, that, absolutely. Is that, is that yep, you designed yep. it in SolidWorks, so, I guess. Yeah, I will have to oh, show you cool. one day. I'll show you the, um, the the presentations we put together. Yeah, you know, yeah. inside SolidWorks, you can do a lot of 3D modeling, right, right, right. finite element analysis, and and so we were able to figure out just kind of how the pressures would work. You know, it had to be rounded edges and um, you know springs, and you know it was. Um, I had a couple other guys, a software engineer that wanted to join up and help us, and so he wrote all the code. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, learned a lot. Wow, that's, a lot. So that's that's great. That's great. Now, what happened after that? Um, you know, kind of dropped that. Kept staying at, at A and M um, in mechanical engineering. Really, yeah. really enjoyed that. Um, started the master's program. Right. Right. Uh, that summer went to Anna Darko. Uh -huh. uh, so big oil company did uh, crisis and emergency management, uh -huh, and so uh -huh. spent four months with those guys. Did a lot of offshore stuff. Uh, went to Colorado a lot. Did some cool drone technology stuff. Um, finished that up, and then came back um, to to school. You know that was during the summer of yeah. two thousand and fifteen ish. Yeah. Um, 
And so that's when um, API Group uh, hired me. Uh -huh. So I was probably, I was about a year out from graduating. Yeah. And uh, one of my buddies from the gym always kept bothering me <laughs> about going to work for him. And I was like, you know, fire sprinklers, like, this can't be that difficult. I've got a fire background and right, you know, right. yada, yada. And what so. does API do? So they, they're a conglomerate. Uh, they're really a parent company. They're publicly traded. Um, and they've got probably, let's just say 40 uh, you know, parent-child companies, if right. you will, underneath them. Right. They do everything from overhead doors to pipelines to majority fire protection, so fire right. and life safety. So all the sprinkler systems and alarm systems you see in these buildings, sure. we install them all. Sure. Um, so that's what they did. That's great. Yeah. And you were there for several years? I was there from 2015 till 2018, and so uh -huh. they, they paid for my MBA program through Minnesota, so I've spent a week a month. You, uh, you're in Minnesota, University of Minnesota? <laughs> well, it was um, uh, St. Thomas okay. Epic. Epicon. Up in so, Minnesota? Yeah. Oh, yep. so you went up to Minnesota? One week a month. Wow. For 18 months. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. that's impressive. <laughs> and yeah. it was, uh, so Lee Anderson was the owner of API Group, yeah. and he had a very special relationship with this university, and yeah. it was kind of a hybrid between, you know, what was best for the for the organization from an M&A standpoint and a strategic standpoint, yeah. as well as, you know, it still had the curriculum backing from a, a university, yeah, if you yeah, will, yeah. and so yeah. they kind of paired the two together and made a very um, tailored, you know, uh, MBA program. Great, so, great. Um, yeah, went through that, and then ultimately in, in 2018, we um, they they decided from a big business decision, they decided they wanted to go union with uh -huh. the workforce, uh -huh. and uh, we had a disagreement there, and um, and ultimately parted ways, and and that's when I started uh, better better fire protection. Okay, where were you living at the time? Did you move back to this area? Were you, were I've you, always been. You've here. always been. I've here. always been here. Yeah, you've so I've been here been since here. 2010. Oh great. Yeah. Okay, got it. And yeah. so so now Better Fire mm -hmm. is your your company that you started, right? Yep, yep. And it, subsequently sold. Yeah, um, tell me about that. So was yeah. that your, you were the the founder and sole founder and CEO? Yeah, I had a couple partners in it, I had a private investor. Uh -huh. Um so that was my thing is you know, I, I didn't I, I wasn't the guy that wanted to have a small boutique business. So uh -huh. It's like I knew I could scale it. I, I already know the systems and the robustness and how to do all this. I yeah. just need somebody to write me a check. Right. Um that's a little harder than, than a lot of people make it out to be if sure. you go to go get a, a big sure. check. Um, so I finally secured that money, secured that check, started the company, um, grew it. Um, you know, we had some big contracts with A and M, Prairie uh -huh. View A and M, uh -huh. Walmart, Sam's Club. You know, that's the beauty of of the fire protection industry is that it's mandated by law yeah. to inspect, test, and maintain these systems. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So all commercial facilities, all your apartment complexes, everybody has to put it in uh -huh. by fire and life safety, and then you have to inspect, test, and maintain it every year. So it has this this recurring revenue piece to it that's sure. contractually obligated for you. So you can really build steady, predictable cash flows. Um, so you were providing a service, or did you have a new a novel product? No, providing a service. Okay. Yep. So okay. definitely a service-based company. Okay. Uh, there's two pieces to the business. One is new construction. Uh -huh. So for instance, like this uh, ILSQ building, uh, yeah. we're building that with Vaughn. Uh, and then the other side is the service base, which is going out and doing inspection, test, and maintenance of existing systems. Okay, so like, like let's suppose I'm a, a company. I guess uh, let's just take a I don't know CJ Barbecue. Yeah. And I, I want to hire you. What what services do you offer? And yeah, so we would we would probably do your extinguishers, right? Uh -huh. We would look at your kitchen hood systems because you're uh, uh -huh. a restaurant of some sort. Uh -huh. We would come in and you have a backflow preventer, which basically stops the water from going into the uh -huh. building, uh, or it stops the water from going back out to the city. We would test that, and we would test your fire alarm system to right. make sure it automatically dials 911 in 10. It operates as intended, and then right. we would test your fire sprinkler system. Okay. So you have all of those types of systems all in that one little building. Oh, okay. And okay, so that, great. you know, that annual contract's gonna be several thousand dollars. Sure. And that's just one, right. one restaurant, you know, and so um, you and, extrapolate that over. And mostly your clients were commercial or, or yeah. any residential or not really? I mean, so in, in the city of College Station or in, in, if you're inside of an enforceable jurisdiction, 6,000 square feet is your limit. Uh -huh. So if you build a house over 6,000 square feet, you have to put fire protection in it. Oh, like this? Like, I mean, at this level? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, 6,000. Yeah. It's a big house. Oh, yeah, that's a big house. So, so that's I'm just curious. That's six thousand under roof, or six thousand living, or how six thousand living. Yeah, 6, air conditioned, heat and cooled. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So it's under that. Actually, you don't have to Correct. do that. Only Correct. That, I yep. don't think most people do that. I just no. didn't know that. No, no, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's one of those things where a lot of people get themselves in a bind with fire protection because they'll, you know, let's say you go out and buy a building, right? And you're yeah. buying just a warehouse, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and you don't understand the commodity classification of the contents that you're trying to put in there. Right. right and so right. let's say that system's designed for these tables, and yeah, you bring yeah. in rubber tires. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a whole different commodity. Right. And, and right. so now you have to completely overhaul your system. You have uh -huh. to have new water supplies, and uh -huh. you know, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh -huh. And if you didn't do your upfront due diligence, yeah. and we've gotten in those situations where it's like you just can't open. The fire marshal shuts it down, right? Because it's his risk, 
and I then your insurance company comes in. So there's all these different people that have, the insurance company yeah. has a perspective, the owner, the, the use, the occupancy of it, uh, the fire marshal, Interesting. And, and then and, us. And this, this uh, service has always been privately provided, right? It's yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And most people contract it out. Does anyone do it internally? No, you're not allowed to. You have to have all the licenses. Oh, so in order okay, to do okay. it, yeah, it's extremely heavily licensed. So I see, I see. And whenever I was uh, working for the other company, I had to get uh, all my fire alarm, fire extinguisher, backflow. Um, it's, it's kind of like a professional engineering license for... Right. Um, for fire protection. And you kind of provide a turnkey service? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, okay. Yeah, okay, 100%, 100%. percent. And, and who are your competitors at that time? Yeah, uh, so I mean- Nationwide chains or- Yeah, exactly, or local, exactly. Local? And that's where you know the opportunity exists for small businesses is the majority of these companies, and I knew this going into it, kind of my mindset was to, to build it and, and sell it in probably five years was kind yeah. of my mindset. Yeah, yeah. Happened a little faster, took about three. Um, but yeah, the majority of the people you're competing against are private equity backed uh -huh. and they're nationwide. They're very large very robust, have a very high overhead component okay. to them. They have corporate allocation fees and things like that. And so their bottom lines are a little skewed. Uh -huh. um, and so I knew getting in there and competing them with them wouldn't be that difficult. Okay, you know? and was that your, your kind of your innovation? Was that you were able, you were leaner and meaner than Yeah, than exactly, the, the that, is, that was our moat, was we were just leaner and meaner. Uh -huh. um, you know, we were able to, to hire and to scale and to grow uh, at a very rapid pace. Okay. You know? uh, cash flow is tough, but uh -huh, um, uh -huh. you know, at the end of the day, it, uh, it all worked out. Were there any novel technologies you were deploying? I mean, I, I used you know, I think that one of the things, and, and I see this now that I've sold my company, when you get in these bigger businesses, they're so much harder to pivot. You know, uh -huh. when you're looking at software, and, yeah. and these, you know, I'm writing a custom software right now for an estimating technology, yeah. and it's just everybody has to put their input into it. And so uh -huh. it takes so long, whereas when you're at a smaller company, you can just pick up the phone and, and change. Yeah. You know, you can just move. And so that I would say that was one of our novel things, was being able to utilize the, the most useful technology from a service ditch batching quoting software. Uh -huh. um, we use a company called Service Trade, uh, which is a web-based app, which was, it was just very good. It was very right. robust. It was specifically designed for the fire protection industry. Right. And um, that was definitely a pivotal part for why we succeeded. How useful to you was that training you did at the Teak Center? I, yeah. I know that's a world-class facility. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have to tell my friends who visit College Station that, no, the airport is not on fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't exploded. Yeah, no. <laughs> it was very useful. You know, I, I tell those stories all the time. You know, one, one of the problems or one of the things in the service-based industry is people cut corners, right? Yeah, they want to yeah. just hang these tags. They want to rush through this stuff. It's like, well, another man is relying on you to do your job. Right. You right, know, that right. firefighter that comes in this building assumes the standpipe system works. So yeah, yeah. the standpipe is an internal hydrant system, if you will, inside this building yeah, based yeah. on its square footage. And so they would be able to carry their hose in here and, and hook up to it and use it. Yeah, well, yeah, they yeah. assume that it's going to work. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, if they get in here and it doesn't, right. Right, they're, they're kind of in, in a bind. Right, um, right. And so those kind of um, relations translate over from a firefighting perspective to really respect the craft of what we're doing yeah, um, yeah. and make sure that it's being done appropriately. Now you never act. Your company never actually had to fight the fire, right? No. You would just alert the fire department, correct? Right. Yep. And in your training, did you did you ever need to do any actual firefighting, or did you? Were you in Teeks, I did. Yeah, absolutely. In Teeks, you did. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. But absolutely. as a business person, you didn't no. have to. That, no, no, didn't no, no, no. No, we had some funny stories, you know, of of um, people like you know, at, at one of the places here in town, I won't name it, but they uh, they baked. Guy was trying to bake his girlfriend some donuts and, <laughs> and uh, on a cookie sheet, and it, you know the, the oil falls off, catches on fire. He tries to carry it out. It you know burns him. He drops yeah. it, sets the apartment on fire. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. sprinkler head goes off, puts uh -huh. the fire out. You know, and then we show up because we have to repair it. Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. cool to see your work. You know, in that instance, if that sprinkler wasn't there, it would burn the whole building to the ground. Oh yeah, right. You know right. what I mean? It, it would have taken you know hours right, to put right, it out. Right, right, right. Uh, whereas this thing puts it out in a matter of seconds, and so oh, that's it, cool. it's cool to see your work. You oh, know, that's great. That, yeah. So I'm just curious. I mean, this is kind of a new area for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no. I'm just, just curious about this. Do you feel like the regulations are sufficient, or yeah. do you feel like uh, they're unnecessary? Uh, yeah. Do people have strong enough incentive to protect their own property on their own? What yeah, do you yeah. Think? I think that uh, it depends on the the letter of the enforcement. And so, you know, we work all across the country now, and, and so I get to see this a lot where you know certain fire marshals will will push certain agendas, if you will. So, yeah. for instance, there's some things like if you go into the rec center at A&M, yeah. we, we have sprinklers above the swimming pool. Uh -huh. And that chlorine just massively corrodes these things, right? Uh -huh, well, uh -huh. NFPA 13 in section 1.1, which is the scope, tells you that this building has to be sprinkled throughout, uh -huh, right? And, uh -huh. and the only way that you can caveat this throughout sentence is section 8.15 will yeah. tell you where you don't have to put them. Yeah. Well, it, there's only about five or ten things you don't have to put sprinklers. Uh -huh. And so above a swimming pool is not one of them. 
Uh-huh. And so it's like stuff like that where I think the industry gets a bad rap sometimes where it's like a money grab almost. Yeah. And then the other side of it where I think uh, the industry loses is uh, our materials and things are extremely expensive because they're stamped and rated, UL rated for fire protection. And so it may be an inferior product to say a plumbing product, right. but it still has the, the term fire associated with it. So it's five times more right, than what right. a normal one would be. Got it. Um, but in, in terms of the, the code sufficiency, absolutely. There's new things coming out now that we can't quite uh, figure out yet. So marijuana growth facilities are one of them uh-huh. that we just haven't really determined how flammable is it? How do we want to put it out? Yeah. Lithium ion battery storage is one of those right. that we're just kind of scratching our heads about these massive Amazon warehouses um, that, you know, store things at 40, 50 feet in the air, you know, how do you get water from the ceiling to the floor? And, and you know, everything's encapsulated in plastic, you know, and so how do we wet that? And, you know, there's a lot of fire dynamic and modeling to it. Um, And that's the engineering side of it that's fun. You know, it's it's looking at these crazy commodities. Uh, We we protect one in Huntsville that's a uh, ammunition manufacturing facility. And so they have primers and gunpowder, which is extremely explosive and flammable. Uh Um, So it's challenges, right? They're fun. But it it goes back to the insurance company and the fire marshal. Are they going to enforce it to the letter of the law? Um, And if not, then it's going to get brushed aside. You've got deep domain expertise in this area. What, yeah. w- in your opinion, what is the uh, opportunities, the unsolved problems here? What innovations do you think could, yeah. like, like what technology does not exist yet, but yeah. could solve some of the problems? In, it's in a space? very antiquated old industry, right? Uh-huh. It's one of those industries where these older guys like to make it difficult, right? Uh-huh, this, is, uh-huh. this is Schedule 40 black steel iron pipe. Right, uh-huh. it's heavy. Yeah. You know, a, a joint of six inch, 21 foot long is 510 pounds. Uh-huh. And we have men picking that stuff up on a daily basis to hang it in the air uh-huh. because it, it has to be steel or the fire would melt it. Uh-huh. Right, so everything we do is extremely redundant. It always has fail safes and backups. And so this industry as a whole is stuck back in, you know, the pre 1990s yeah. from a technology standpoint. And that's the opportunity that exists is that. From a cash flow standpoint, it's mandated by law. It's kind of like insurance. It's a necessary evil. And that was the way I always sold the, the inspections business. It's like, look, you may, not, you may not like me or, you know, whatever it is, but you're going to pay somebody to come and inspect this stuff, yeah. right? Because we have to put tags on everything. And so yeah. give me an opportunity, right? Um, and, and so I guess that's where the, the opportunity comes from is that a lot of these businesses, you know, with the baby boomers, and, and I'm sure John talked about it on the last episode, is, you know, business acquisition is huge for us right now. And that's, that's a majority of what I do is, is M&A. Um, it, it's looking at these businesses that we're, that we're looking to buy, um, doing, um, analyzing their cash flows and, and their customer diversity base and, and understanding, you know, and it's funny because you, you kind of get biased, but it's understanding, you know, what is their P&L? Right? What does it look like over the past five years? What's predictable? Um, a lot of these guys are looking to sell these businesses and exit yeah. over the next coming years because yeah. they're, they're baby boomers. You know, so that's that's the opportunity. So you were talking about, I guess, a steel, a heavy steel pipe. Is mm-hmm. that right? Uh, w- tell me, what what's the context of that? That's it's right there. So if you look, oh. yeah, it's right up there. You, this building is sprinklered. Oh, I see. So these are the 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 pipes that the uh, the, the, spring, water the water travels through has to travel through. Yeah. So we'll, we'll basically come in off the city main, uh-huh, right, and uh-huh. we'll come inside the building, and then we'll. Sp- Prig up to a, a set of control valves, oh, and then I from see. there we'll we'll put piping a piping network throughout the entire building, which is steel. And, and then it has to be, by law; it has to be, be steel. steel, unless you're in um, residential. So apartment oh, complexes have plastic. Oh really? Yep. Okay, okay. And you guys lay the pipe. Yep. You, you lay all that pipe. We thread and... it. We groove it. Yeah. We oh, weld it. Oh, I see. I yep. see. Got yep. it. Got and so it. there's you know hospitals are a big one. Industrial. Um, you know we do a lot of work in Houston at the industrial places. Obviously higher education. Yeah. Any commercial building has to have it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's sounds pretty labor intensive. Extremely. Can, can robots help? You think? I mean, I don't think so. I think know. that um, you know, at the end of the day, the problem is, is that it's it, you're always in a fight and a battle for ceiling space. And so uh, we use what's called BIM technology now, which is like a computer modeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it works very well when everyone uses it. So what this is is basically we'll get a floor print of a of a building from a CAD structure standpoint, and we'll know where all the beams are and all the concrete T posts and if it's uh, post tension or whatever it is. And then everybody will start to upload their models inside this model. And so you'll have the HVAC guy, the plumbers, the electricians, the sprinkler right. guy. Everybody puts their stuff in there. Right, right. And then we run a process called clash detection, and then we all begin to move. Right. And so we're trying to, well, the problem is, is that uh, unsophisticated subcontractors don't use this technology. Sure. And so they'll outsource it to somebody who doesn't really have any sort of financial tie to it being successful or not. Right, right. When it's used correctly, take, for instance, this ILSQ project, 
when when the general contractor holds everyone accountable to it, then it's a very successful job. Yeah. And, and in theory, right, it's supposed to go in like Legos. So we ship all this stuff in on an 18 wheeler, and it's it's got you know steel pipe and it's threaded. And you take P, piece A one B and you stick it in the air, and then A one C and then A one D, and you just bolt this thing together like a Lego project. Yeah. Well, that's where the term pipe fitter comes in. Uh -huh. Is whenever he's putting it up and he hits a piece of ductwork uh -huh, or he hits uh -huh. a piece of conduit or uh -huh. he hits a light or a wall or whatever it is. Right. And that's where that labor intensive, you just have to have a human element there because yeah. he starts fitting pipe. Changing. So this, so you guys are, in, like, for new construct, new commercial construction, you're involved in the construction. Oh, absolutely. At, We're another like, contract. Another contract. You're another, another sub. sub. That's exactly sub. what we are. That's, right. that's, that's the construction side. The service side is where we work direct with owners. Right. And so we're working, you know, with North Point Crossing or, you know, Hunter Goodwin and these guys, and we work directly for them, and we go in and maintain their systems existing. Uh -huh. Or, you know, traditionally what happens, and this is kind of the, the blunt of the industry, is that it corrodes over time. You know, steel with yeah. stagnant water in it just sits there and just eats and corrodes. Um, and so, you know, you're coming up on the life cycle of 20 years, let's say, and that stuff just starts getting pinhole after pinhole. The after water pinhole. just stays up there? Just sits stagnant. Just sits there for... Just waiting on something to happen. Oh, wow. So if you yeah. don't use your, your fire, fire, if your sprinklers never go off, it's just going to... Every year, we'll drain it. We oh, drain we do it. drain it every So we year. drain it every year, yeah. and we'll refill it. Uh, okay. We'll come in and test it, make sure it all still works as, yeah. as designed. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah. So I guess what, on the business side, running the, the Better Fire business, what's mm -hmm. your biggest pain point? Uh, probably people, I would say. Yeah. You know, um, hiring uh, individuals. You know, we, we grew the business very fast, you know, from zero to t a little over $10 million yeah. in a matter of, of two or three years. And, and that's a very quick scale pace, yeah. you know. Um, and so trying to handle all the hiring and training, um, reinvesting back in your people, developing that culture, if you will. Right. Um, you know, it, it was very difficult. You know, I, I, a bunch of the guys that worked for me were actually college friends of mine. Sure, um, sure. That, you know, ultimately just had odds and end jobs, you know, weren't making a lot of money. And I was like, hey, this is a, it's a very niche, lucrative industry. They uh -huh. don't teach this in school. Right, right, There's only right. two programs in the country. Uh, one's in Maryland and one's at OSU, and that's right. it. Most people don't even know about this. Probably. No, yeah, no, it's a, yeah. it's a kind of an unheard of industry. Right. Um, but it's it's very highly paid and it's uh -huh. very recession resistant because of the recurring revenue piece. Yeah. So yeah. as you know, if the economy takes a dive and construction goes down, uh -huh. we still have all this inspect, test, and maintain business over here that we still have to do. Uh -huh. And so we're not we're not that dependent on the economy, if you will, from a, a business standpoint. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now tell me, uh, you're about the exit, I guess. So you were thinking of selling? Is that was your goal from the yeah, outset? Yeah, that was always my goal at the back end. You know, I didn't start this business to like, oh, I'm going to run it for the next 35. And years. why is that? You didn't. You I didn't. just knew that there was more to uh, business than just this fire protection industry. Uh -huh. I, it was a great opportunity for me. I had, you know, kind of the world in front of me. I was, um, I think, I wasn't married at the time. I'm yeah. Married now and no kids, I didn't even have a dog, uh -huh. so I had nothing else to do but uh -huh. work. And right, so I, right. you know, I worked a lot, and uh, I don't regret that, you know, it's just one of those things where you grind. But you had no ambitions to be the largest fire protection no, provider I, in the world? No, I knew, I knew once I got it to about that $10 million mark that, <clears throat> you know, there's a total addressable market, right, the yeah. TAM. And I knew that you're about at the TAM of what this industry has to offer you in this geographical area. Uh -huh. So the only other option is to start acquiring people, yeah. right? or uh, start, you know, expanding out to Houston, Austin, Dallas, wherever. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, there's a ton of liability that gets opened up that, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up with any money. Right. So my dad's a firefighter, my sure. mom's been disabled since I was a little kid. Uh -huh. And so I, I saw this and I was like, you know, my entire net worth is wrapped up in this thing. Yeah. Um, is there an opportunity here to, yeah. to sell? Uh -huh. And so luckily at one of my um, mentors, it was on the board of CI Capital. Uh -huh. So he had some in insider information, if you will, um, of just kind of, um, you know, I, I kept going home at night after I talked to him and just kind of told myself, like, I just, what does that guy gain out of lying to me? Uh -huh. You know, and so he was telling me kind of, you know, the, the process of selling, what it looks like and, and all that. And that's when I really got involved in M&A and really started to understand it from a, a real standpoint of networking capital adjustments and, and yeah. going through all this stuff. Um, and so that's whenever, you know, got the, the group together and was like, look, you know, I think that this is a better move for us is to yeah. join a, a much larger company, diversify our risk take right. some chips off the table, sure. reinvest in private equity. Sure. Um, that was a big part of it was the, the, com the reinvestment component in a private equity. Okay. You know, there's a ton of opportunity there on invested capital to, to make multiples there, uh, which is, you know, if you, if you four or five extra money there, you know, how hard and how long would you have had to work for that yeah. to take place? Yeah, yeah. You know, and then as, as these private equity companies, you know, I told you BlackRock came in and bought us, 
as they come in and make these acquisitions, you know, one of their goals is they haven't really decided if they want to roll it and go public, if they want to do SPAC, traditional IPO, sell it to another private equity company. Right. Um, but each time, as you move up higher in this food chain, they, they begin to incentivize you with private shares. And, sure. you know, it's kind of like a Google or one of these guys. Yeah. Um, they give you X number of salary and then X number of stock and say, hey, you know, we want you to stay. And so I knew all that stuff was coming. Uh -huh. um, and I knew there would be a ton of opportunity there, not just for me, but for all my people. You know, I was able to hire and scale. I didn't, I, one of the things I've always said, told people about business is that you want to make business decisions, not cash flow decisions. And as a small business owner, I made a lot of decisions based on cash flow. And that doesn't mean that it's the best decision for the business. Sure. Right. It's the best decision that keeps everybody paid, <laughs> yeah, which yeah, is yeah. the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I knew that, that joining a larger company like this and, and I really liked, you know, uh, Phil uh, is my good friend and, yeah. and I really liked him and, and Jeff Everard, our CEO, solid guys, uh, really got along well with them. Um, and so, yeah, we joined last January. Okay. And uh, you were so you were a founder and CEO of Better Fire, is yep. that right? Okay. Yep. You had other co-founders, or you were the only? Yeah, I had, a, I had a couple partners in a private, um, you know, basically okay. a private fund. And then once you sold, you joined Summit, is mm -hmm. that right? Yep. Okay. And that's yep. a lo that's a larger, larger yeah, fire yeah. production so they're, company. At the time, they were probably twelve hundred people. Now they're thirty five hundred. Uh huh. Um, so where are the, they based out of? They're based out of Minnesota. Oh, I see. Okay. Yep. Oh, yep. Minnesota, your old place. Right. I know. <laughs> right down the road. And um, yeah, so whenever they bought us, you know, it was one of those things where they had a, an organization, two organizations they had bought in Dallas, uh -huh. an organization in Houston, uh, and an organization in Lufkin. Uh -huh. And so uh -huh. they had these other offices that were very strong in other parts of the business we weren't very strong in. So there's, there's the PE side, uh, a pre-engineered side, and the fire extinguisher side, which are all of your kitchen hood systems. They come pre-engineered yeah. in your fire extinguisher as well. That wasn't something that we were very big in. We didn't, you know, we did it, but we weren't like pushing it. Sure. Well, none of these other guys did fire sprinklers. But we were knocking down seven, eight million dollars a year in sprinklers. And so it was one of those things where we kind of fit the perfect puzzle piece to say, hey, they can help us with their expertise. We can help them with ours. And then as this thing continues to scale, um, which, you know, everybody tries to sell you the, the rainbow picture. Um, these guys actually did it. You know, they took it from uh, whenever they bought us, we were doing, um, I want to say it was around like 13, 14, uh, it was probably 15 million dollars in EBITDA. Total uh -huh. summit was, uh -huh. and when they sold it to BlackRock, it was doing fifty-two. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. And they did that in a matter of twelve months. Wow! And then now it's well over one hundred and forty million in EBITDA. Wow! Yeah, that's, well, that's how. Not bad. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. That's it's not all right. bad. Yeah. And, that, and that's why whenever I told you I, you know, I, I elected to stay after my employment agreement, it was like you know, um, this could be one of the coolest rides that I get to be on yeah. as a, you know, an employee, an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and being high up in the organization, you get to see all this and understand sure. it. And, and kind What's of, your role right now at Summit? So my, my role, I'm a VP of Vice President. Um, I oversee eight offices in Texas, about 70 million in revenue. Um, and so my day to day looks like, you know, I usually work from home unless mm -hmm. I'm going to travel to one of these offices inside Texas. Yeah. Um, and then I basically, every office has a branch manager. And typically those branch managers are prior owners. Yeah. You know, that's kind of how that works. They buy these companies, they allow you to reinvest in private equity and they hold on to you. Okay. Um, and, and so I, I help them with organizational structure. How are we gonna scale? What are our pain points? What do the systems look like, the processes? Because th that's the main thing they change when they buy you is they say, hey, here's some new accounting software. Sure. Here's new scheduling dispatching software. Here's new forms. Here's you know, all this right. new stuff. Right. So I make sure that they you know, have some cohesion there. Um, and then, you know, really develop an org chart and say, all right, you know, now it's time to yeah. put the lever down. And, yeah. and it's been challenging. It's been good. I've got, I've got a really uh, solid group of guys. Um, the challenging part is, is you're taking an owner that's likely uh, twice my age. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, but I, I think you earn that respect from them sure. with your understanding of business. And, sure. and when we go through, like, working processes and things like that, they begin to see that it's like, okay, there's some solvency behind all this crazy stuff, you know. One of the guys, the guy from Lufkin calls it uh, Summit's Fuzzy Math, uh -huh. which is, uh -huh. you know, are you familiar with uh, cash and accrual based accounting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. So imagine explaining that to, you know, a bunch of rednecks. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that's what we deal with. And, and I'm not, you know, I, I come from a very humble background, so I don't take yeah. offense to those statements. But it's like I'm sitting there trying to explain to them that, you know, as we go through the month, right. our costs and our billings are shown on a cash basis. Right, well, then right. eventually at the end of the month, we switch over to an accrual basis based uh -huh. on an assumed gross margin of unclosed projects and all, uh -huh. you know. 
And uh, I was, I said, so I gave my spiel to him, and I said, all right, does that make sense? And, and one of the ladies stood up, and she was like, it made sense until you started talking. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> right, and everybody right. got a good laugh out of it, and I was like, that's all right. right. I'm going to keep trying. Yeah, so, yeah. But no, that, that's kind of what my day-to-day looks like. So you brought your entire staff over? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yeah. they're all employed by Summit now? Yeah, 100%. We, okay. uh, we didn't lose anybody. Are and, they all local to the college station? Yeah, yeah. yeah our office is, is in South College Station. Oh, it is? Is that right? You yeah. have an office here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, great. We've that was your old Better Fire office? Correct. Oh, yeah, we, we probably have near an 80 employees okay like 90 employees oh wow okay yeah okay yeah. okay great so we've um yeah we've got a, a lease down there and uh-huh. um like i said we have houston pasadena mansfield yeah fort worth yeah, know, yeah, yeah. All the offices. i see i see so so i guess in traditional like tech uh, I, uh tech acquisitions yeah you might have some like golden handcuffs uh and the, the kind of the owners the founders are sort of waiting for that to uh expire before they Correct. do something else is that what what are your plans? Do you have any, any, any ideas? Yeah, I think um, you know it's it's funny. I, I've been told many times not to uh, predetermine my judgment on what right. I want to do, right. um, because they can obviously incentivize you in different ways to yeah. stay. I think I think in my mind, I, I'm going to stick it out to see the IPO or the next sell. Uh-huh. Um, and I think at that point, you know, we'll see. I'd like to join Phil uh, in his private equity company. Um, he, he owns a company called Sidekick Operators, uh-huh, uh-huh. and um, and so I, I've worked with those guys. They're all Aggies. Oh, and, is that right? Uh-huh. Yeah, oh, yeah, they're wow. all, all Aggies. What, so. what, what, what does that company do? So they're a private equity firm that buys, um, you know, either non-controlling or controlling interest in service-based businesses. Service-based, so, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, like, for instance, one of the ones they own now is, is called Oscar Larson, and they install um, electrical vehicle charge stations throughout the country. Uh-huh. And so I, I believe he bought them in 2020. Uh-huh. Um, Where are so, they located, the, the, uh, these Aggies? Uh, oh, Phil and them are out of... Um, New Braunfels area. Oh, okay. okay, okay. I think San Antonio, New Braunfels, and Houston. There's uh-huh. there's a handful of them in there, yeah. and um, you know it's stuff like that that really interests me. I think there's an opportunity to build generational wealth out of acquiring these businesses, teaching them how to scale, implementing systems, processes, procedures, yeah. do maybe doing a, a roll up and then and then selling it to a larger private equity firm that wants to you know, do something else with it. Right. Um, you know, I know that their their timeline horizon is pretty extended. A lot yeah. of these. Uh, have a four to five year, you know, deployment of capital um, yeah. kind of timeline. Yeah. Um, sidekicks is, is a little bit more extended than that. Yeah. And so um, I, I think that's probably the next. The other thing, you know, I, I, and then you saw the, we do a lot of short term rentals. So I do a lot of real estate uh-huh. um, on the side. And yeah. and so that's been fun and interesting. I think that, um, I think, you know, I've got probably two or three years left on my contract. And so I'm, I'm definitely locked up. Right, 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 you know, right. I hate so talking about like I'm in prison, but <laughs> it's not that bad. So you're doing, fi- uh, Summit is still fire protection. All absolutely. So your 100%. life is still 100% fire protection. 100%, yeah. So you're still in, in the... Yeah, in, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's morphed into a lot more business, which I kind of like is the bigger business picture. And, and, you know, I'm not in the day-to-day operations trying to figure out how to design a system yeah, or, yeah, you yeah. know, something like that. Um, but I still have to get down in the weeds, you know, with some of these guys, they'll... They want to bid a big project. We bid one last week. It was 1.4 million out of Houston, uh, and those guys don't have the technical expertise to bid something like that. And so right. I'll, I'll give my chance to dive down into the weeds, and uh, right. I enjoy it. You know, I do. Okay. I just think that um, I think after a while, you know, you want a different change of pace, For try, sure, yeah. try something else. Yeah. So, so, so let me um, let me uh, kind of speak to our ultimate audience, the students in the room. Yeah, absolutely. So, what what would you say to? Let me ask you, what was really elemental during your time at A and M? That w- that determined sort of where you are today, uh, kind of as an entrepreneur. Yeah. What were the key, most valuable uh, <coughs> parts of your education, either in curriculum or outside? Yeah, I think I think a big part of it for me is the discipline um, that came with, you know, working out, working full time, you know, being a student athlete. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't have time to do anything else, and, yeah. and so I had my head down and, and was working hard for a long time, and I think that discipline just kind of overlaid into the the working world. And you just kind of, you know, evolve that as a habit of life and how you live um, and, and kind of a sense of excellence and, and wanting to do more. Um, I think, you know, there's no question that um, some of it's luck. You know, you kind of hit the right the right strokes at the right sure. time. Um, but I, I do think that I think networking is a big strength of mine that I do a lot. Uh, I, I'm intentional about it. I, you know, if, if you set me on someone that's like, hey, this guy would really someone you need to know that yeah. I'll, I'll turn the charm on. And yeah. my wife laughs at me every time I do it because I'll. Uh, you know, there's times where I'm like an extroverted introvert. If, <laughs> if I don't need to say anything, I'll sit in my corner and, and be quiet. If if I think that it's time for me to go, then I'll, I'll go. Um, but I think meeting key people like Dr. Benden, uh, Phil, um, Bill Welch. Dr. Welch is another one that, um, you know, I met him at 5 a.m. in a sauna one time, and he's <laughs> like 80. Oh, and wow. I had no idea who he was, and we sat there and uh, and talked. And, and it's funny, we just saw each other every single morning at 5 a.m. at the gym. And, yeah. Uh, 
ultimately developed a, a great relationship. I, I moved out to his ranch in Burnham uh -huh. during college and uh -huh. lived there for a year and, um, you know, been, been helping him with all kinds of different business stuff. And so um, I think it's being intentional with those relationships and being upfront about, um, like I told Phil when we first started talking, I was like, here's, you know, I'm, I'm going to use you as a mentor and I'm going to annoy you until you tell me to go away. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it was all about business, you know, uh, tell me a book to read, you know, what do I need to do? And, and so he really, um, you know, as long as you take their advice and run with it, I think that's the, the biggest thing. Now, a lot of students, uh, you know, A&M does a great job placing a lot of students to big companies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you could say that's kind of what we what we do. It's right. Kind of like a, uh, but staple. It's a staple. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, given that that's the majority of what students end up doing, like how, how did you um, manage to kind of st strike out on your own? And what would you say to students who may not want that that big company lifestyle? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I, I answered this question on a podcast not too long ago. They said, how do you avoid the rat race? And my answer was don't. You know, if you don't get inside these bigger organizations and understand how life works and what these big systems and these operating systems are and how this stuff goes, uh, time is on your side when you're in college. You know, yeah. you don't, you're don't you not in some big rush to go out. And, and I think a lot of people take this entrepreneurial thing and think that they've got to create something new that's never been there before. Well, maybe you just need to optimize it a little bit better. Yeah. And so um, one of the things that I, that I want as a society for us to do is is kind of uh, bring change to light and, and make it a positive thing that you know we should be able to go out and and have a job and then realize this isn't what i want to do this isn't what i love i'm going to go over here and try this yeah. and i'm going to go you know what i mean and, and i'm not saying that to job hop a lot but i think a lot of people get in their mind and they go spend four or five years in university and they become a me mechanical engineer and then they hate it it's like well now what now I, now i feel bad that i spent five years doing this and now right. i don't like it and it's like well you know change is just part of life it's who we are as a species and so yeah. um I, I think to directly answer your question i think going to these large organizations and seeing it's good i think going to these smaller businesses and understanding it um, is great but these large organizations are going to show you the systems and processes that you need from a from a metric standpoint that was the big thing for me was data yeah. was understanding the predictability of your cash flow how much revenue is each, each technician going to, to do. So, you know, you can look at these businesses and say, if it's doing $10 million, I know you need at least 80 to 90 guys. Yeah. I mean, I can just, I can, you don't have to give me your P&L and I can probably tell you close to what it is yeah. because they're very predictable businesses. And so going in with that intentionality to learn that stuff, I think is, uh, is huge. All right, okay, okay. And um, so, uh, so we're trying to do a lot here at A&M to encourage more innovation and entrepreneurship. You know, yeah. it is, uh, yeah, you know, it's a small population right now, but we ho we're hoping to, to grow it over time. What are, uh, I think also you're, you're, you're also unique because you're local, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we're trying to find new ways to engage with alumni. Right. What uh, ideas do you have in that, that area? Yeah. Based on, kind of traditionally, <clears throat> you know, I think the university would, uh, A, ask you once your net worth gets above, you know, $100 million, yeah. <laughs> so, or, or they would say, well, you've got a ring on your finger, you should you know, kind right. of donate to football. Right. What, what would be some better better ways for you if, that you prefer to engage with the yeah. campus? Yeah, uh, so I'm a part of the Aggie, Aggie Angel Network, yep. and so yeah. I, I do invest there. I've invested in a couple of Aggie startups. Yeah. Um, you know, I think aside from that, being part of the McFerrin Center, uh, I work a lot with Blake Petty. And, yeah. You know, I, I think the avenue is, is really to get these mentors in a room, the guys that want to be there, right, and to help these, these students understand what it is they're trying to accomplish and what route they're going down and then yeah. break it down from your technical expertise, you know, in my industry, construction or whatever it is. Um, but I think, I think they'd be surprised with how many Aggies don't mind giving back. Sure. I think there's probably some, some gray area there between, you know, guys that take equity and, and make investments and things like that. And that can't necessarily, kind of like Aggie Angel Network, right? It's like a, a dotted line to the university. We're not right. we're not a correlated yeah, uh, or yeah. associated with it, yeah. um, and so I think there's some gray area there. But I think that there's there's several centers, you know, between Startup Aggieland, McFerrin. I don't know if Startup Aggieland's even around anymore. Yeah, not really. But okay, yeah. so McFerrin Center, yeah. um, Aggie Angel Network. I know there's a lot going on. Unfortunately, Laura Lee left. She was right. great. Right, right, um, right. But yeah, I, I think that you know, just having more events and and I I, I don't really know the the startups that are going on unless they come to Aggie Angel Network and pitch us. Yeah, right, But at right. that point, you're, you're kind of in a seed round or something like that, you know what I mean? You actually have a moat and you have traction and you're, right, not, right, right, you're right. not just an idea anymore. You know, you're yeah. looking for money. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's funny, if you look at the ecosystem, there's, a, there are, there's some places where we're serving that, that, that assembly line and others where there's kind of a gap. Right. And um, e even, even that, where I probably spend a lot of my time is on the students who want to do something different. Uh, but they, you know, again, most people just join these big companies and trying to convert some of them over to try something new for a, a, six months, a year. Right. 
Um, and so, so hopefully you get to someone who can eventually pitch to the Aggie Angel Network. Right, whatever. right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so your plan is staying in this area, is that right? That, yeah, that's yeah. Long, long I think plan. that's. I've got a sister in San Antonio and a sister in Dallas. Um, my parents are still in East Texas, and so I don't. I don't think we're going to go anywhere. Um, you know, barring in two or three years, that might change. But for the foreseeable, we just built a place uh, out. I was telling you in Iola. Oh, great! Uh, moved in out there the nice. weekend of the uh, the tornado. Great. So that was fun. You yeah. have your own powerlifting setup there. Yeah, I, it's funny. <laughs> I do. Are yeah. you still lifting? Yeah, so I don't compete anymore. Right, but I still live for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's it's just one of those things with time, and you know, so I, I don't yeah. I don't uh, compete. But yeah, I, I did I actually built a really nice gym. That was my uh, gift to myself. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. It's funny. That's great. Um, yeah, it's just gonna be hard for you to get a spotter. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your my wife's not gonna not gonna cut. It. Yeah, it's not gonna cut it. <laughs> that's great. Well, that this has been super interesting. Yeah, uh, Robert. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Really, really interesting. Uh, anything else you I guess you would like any words of advice uh, you'd have to say to future students. Uh, about um, you know, kind of charting their own path. Any other? Yeah, uh, you know, I think a lot of it. Um, you know, if you look back at my journey and and you look at it on paper, right? It looks yeah. like, man, this guy had all this planned out and he was, <laughs> you know, knocking this stuff down. And yeah. and it really didn't. It didn't go like that. It didn't flow like that. It was just one of those things where I had my head down and I was working really hard. And as opportunities came up, I was in a position to capitalize because of all the hard work. And, and stuff that I'd put in, I call it like compounding interest uh, yeah. of discipline and, yeah. and knowledge and things. And so um, I think that's one of the biggest things for me is like, don't, don't think you always have to have it planned out. I'm a big goal setting guy and a planning guy, but you know, you have your head down and you work really hard. And then when opportunities come up, come up, you're able to capitalize in that, that position. That's a big great. part of it. That's yeah. great. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Robert, thank you for taking the time to join us this, this afternoon. Uh, and I uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode uh, and uh, we look forward to having a, a lot more lot more episodes like this for the future thank yeah, you I appreciate it All right.